that would give light. So they uh, found a hide, and as far as I can tell, it was a deer hide that they thought would uh, brighten the, the earth. And so they did that, and when they made it, then they placed it up in the heaven now. future for humanity off planet and we need to set about sharpening the skills that it takes for humans to learn how to live further and further away from the earth one of these days one of these years one of these centuries people will look back on these years and marvel I don't think we really understand the significance what happened 25 years ago. I was working for a department in the central part of Florida, and we had a duty in an orange grove uh, where there was people stealing oranges and we had to stake it out to catch them. And I remember laying in that orange grove night after night and watching the Russian Sputnik go over. And there was a great feeling among everybody that I talked to in uh, my police work that uh, the United States could not be second. We could not be second. We knew that Russia was trying to put a man on the moon. We knew this. And it just seemed to be the criteria, we gotta be first, we gotta be first. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom. And therefore we intend to be first. The first message that Gagarin got on his flight was, uh, let the capitalist beat that. Uh, that until we landed men on the moon, the Russians would beat us in everything. They'd have the biggest rocket. They would have more men in space. They would have more accomplishments in space. We'll be sure we are behind, and we'll be behind for some time in man flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. When a rocket went off, people would start to yell, missile, missile, and run outside to see it. Now, um, you know, it seems odd now when I think about it, but at the time, we'd all run out there dressed or not, you'd find people in their bathrobes, uh, sheets wrapped around them. There was a, a little girl down the street one time who ran out of her house. Uh, I guess she'd been in the bath and she just had a washcloth, you know, held up against her chest. But everybody wanted to see the rocket. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. 
that goal to land a man on the moon and return him to Earth safely by the end of the decade was ever present. It wasn't, um, it wasn't as if you were, someone was beating you on the head with it. It was something, at least for me and I think for almost everyone, which was inside. We were pushing ourselves. In Apollo 1, I was going to be the flight director of the first major test where they were going to uh, do a real live countdown. We'd been having a lot of routine troubles. I mean, any early countdown of, of vehicles, both the launch, the, the rocket tree and the spacecraft itself, we'd had a lot of problems with various kinds, systems problems. We had a lot of trouble with the communication system. By the time they got the spacecraft pressurized, it was about 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, in Houston, and uh, suddenly, uh, after everything was sort of calm and nothing going on to speak of anything, they were checking out various things on the vehicle, and uh, you heard this, uh, we got a fire in here. It all happened so fast, just a matter of seconds. I did see a shaking going on. I did see some cables move. And then we could tell there was silence from the spacecraft something had happened. You heard all this uh, 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 emergency procedural talk. You heard the people in the blockhouse. You heard the people on the pad saying things and jumping. You could tell it was jumping around. You could hear in the background from that, you could hear the crew uh, making noises and some screams. And uh, one of them, I think I remember one of them saying, I'm on fire or something like that. knew almost immediately that it was very serious and you had prayers in your head that they would survive but knew that they probably hadn't. When they got the hatch open, they, I heard them ask, well, what is the, what, uh, what are the astronauts' condition? And they said, well, you don't want to hear us words to that effect because he looked inside the spacecraft and there was dead char inside there. The fire made those of us that were involved in the program realize that we were not uh, infallible. And the night after the fire, we had dinner and uh, had too much to drink. Uh, we then, uh, in the culmination of the evening, uh, threw all our glasses in the fireplace, rather like the old uh, World War I movies, uh, had an enormous hangover and then got on to work. But that ended it for us. A lot of the people that hadn't been involved in tragedies before never did, re never did kick the uh, drinking problems or, or the emotional problems that were associated with that tragedy. All the materials had to be uh, reanalyzed and fire tested and we redesigned all kinds of things and it was a very very serious question of course were we going to still be able to make the goal of landing on the moon um, given this incredible setback as we worked our way through it it began to look as though it was still possible but everything would have to work right and of course that tightened the race that much more I mean <laughs> uh, we, we had basically three flights that had to work essentially perfectly if we were going to land on the moon on the fourth flight and we could just barely get those in before the end of the decade so it, it got to be a very tight race but again it energized everybody because it was possible and by damn we're going to do it
It was proposed by George Lowe that we consider going to the moon. Our initial reaction to that was, well, that's a pretty tough job to do, and uh, we're not sure we can do that. But after talking to uh, some of my colleagues in flight operations, they, they thought about it for a day or so, and they came back extremely enthusiastic about the job. They thought it was a tremendous challenge. They thought it was a great thing to do. They thought it was really something that would advance the state of the knowledge that we had, and they felt like if we could go in orbit around the moon, we would really have a leg up then on the lunar landing that we were going to do later. I think that the decision to send uh, Apollo 8 to the moon was affected by our desire to get to the moon first. There had been uh, reports through the CIA that the Russians were preparing for a lunar flyby by the end of 68, and I think that that affected the mission for Apollo 8. Nineteen sixty-eight was an incredible uh, and a very debilitating year in, in American history with the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the Vietnam War, turmoil on the college campus. The country seemed to be coming apart. You had two Americas uh, from our point of view and, and NASA at that time. Because NASA was almost untouched by that because at the same time of this ferment all across America, we had technological accomplishment. Going to the moon, of course, other than going around the Earth, there is a lot of differences. There's no rescue capability of any sort. And uh, I broke the news to, to my wife, uh, Marilyn, uh, when I got back to Houston. Uh, we had planned to spend Christmas in Mexico, as a matter of fact. And of course, we, we were going to be launched earlier. So I said, no, I don't think I want to go to Mexico. I think uh, for over the Christmas holidays, I think I'll go to the moon. Knowing that that vehicle then was going to go to the moon for the first time, that we were going to leave the Earth's gravitational field, that man was going to see the moon for the first time, that we were going to go in orbit around another body, all of those things were flashing through our mind, I'm sure, as that vehicle was sitting on the pad and getting ready to go. It was a tremendous feeling. Zero. We have commit. We have off. The clock is running. 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the tower. Roger. Howdy here, Houston. Clear. clear. Following Houston, you are go for staging. Over. Uh, uh, for Borman and myself, old hat, uh, this was Anders' first flight. Uh, but the spacecraft looked like it checked out perfectly. Everybody on the ground thought it was okay. And Borman says we've got Seco. Cutoff was right on the second. All right, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. All right, you are go for TLI. Over. 
Ignition. And the thrust is okay, Booster says. I was the navigator and inputted the computer all the parameters to relight the engine and everything, and we lit the engine. Then we watched the computer and the display count rapidly up as the velocity got faster and faster and faster and faster. And finally, when it shut down exactly like it should, you know, I mean, we were really going fast, almost, you know, 25,000 miles an hour at that time. And when we finally separated and turned around and looked at the earth, uh, it was quite a sight. Give us a clue as to what it looks like from way up there. This is a beautiful, beautiful view with a predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. On the Apollo 8 flight, it took us about uh, three days to get there, a little less than three days. But the last day, uh, we had the blunt end of our spacecraft pointed towards the moon in preparation for lighting the engine to slow down and uh, to get captured by the moon's gravity. Therefore, we did not see the moon grow rapidly as we got closer to it. And uh, the ground called up and said, at such and such a time, you will lose communication with us because the moon will start to pull you around to the far side uh, because of its gravity. Apollo 8, this is Houston at 6804, your goal for LOI. OK, Apollo 8 is go. Uh, you're riding the best bird we can find. We'll see you on the other side. I was the one that talked everybody into going into orbit around the moon in the first place. And uh, then sitting there and wondering whether the rocket had fired, whether it fired well, whether the navigation guidance system worked properly, and whether they were going to show up on their way back to the Earth was a damn long 30 minutes for me. When we uh, lit the engine, uh, which was perhaps the most dramatic moment, because remember, we were a satellite of the moon. Should that engine fail to function, we would still be a satellite of the moon. And consequently, uh, I, since I was a navigator, I put in all the parameters. And the, in five seconds before the engine would light, uh, a display on the computer comes up and essentially says, do you really want to make this maneuver? And if you do, you hit the proceed button. I hesitated for a little bit, and Foreman said, you know, hit the proceed button. Go, go. The computer lit the engine. Uh, we slowed down. Uh, the computer then said we are in lunar orbit, but we, we looked out the windows and all we could see is blackness. You know, where is this moon? What happened to it? Uh, and then we rotated the spacecraft around 180 degrees, and there, just 60 miles below, were the ancient old craters of the far side of the moon. Got it. Uh, we've got it. Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Lovell. By 60.5. Good to hear your voice. Uh, Apollo 8 Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles? Over. Okay, uh, Houston. The moon is essentially gray. No color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Okay, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. 
Uh, we were like three school kids looking into a candy store window. We forgot the flight plan. We were just looking at those ancient craters as they slowly slipped by underneath us. And you know, then finally, finally as we came around the moon uh, for the very first time, Borman and I were sort of looking ahead uh, at the horizon. Anders was in charge of photography, so his job was to take pictures on the far side. Uh, and, and suddenly, out of the horizon came the Earth. Beautiful sight. Well, Frank and I said, we have to take a picture of this. Anders, who heard that comment, said, no, no, we have only so many frames of film, we must put them all here on the moon. And then Bill looked up and said, oh, we've got to take a picture of this. All three of us had cameras. All three of us took pictures. One of them became very famous. I think just about everybody in the world has seen it. It's called Earthrise. It was made into a stamp in 1969. Now, if you go around and meet Frank Borman, ask him who took the picture, he will say, I was the commander. Obviously, it's my photograph. If you happen to talk to Bill Anders, who took that picture, he'll say, I was a photographer. That is my photo. But ladies and gentlemen, let it be known here and now, it was I who took that picture. I, I kid Bill Anders about it, that he was had all of the film allocated and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't you waste any on aesthetics. But he denies that and claims that he takes it. It's a, it's a point of open contention now about who took the picture. Actually, I think Bill did. <laughs> the vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis. I could put my thumb up to the window of the uh, of the spacecraft and completely hide the Earth between behind my thumb. Now you have to think about that for a moment. Everything that you have ever known, all your loved ones, uh, your career, uh, the whole world, all the world's problems, the wars, and everything else, is behind your thumb. Uh, and you realize then just how insignificant we are that the Earth is merely a, a planet around a rather normal star tucked away in the outer part of one galaxy and we're only one of millions of galaxies. The key memory that I have of the Apollo 8 flight was looking back at the Earth. And the nostalgia, and the Christmas Eve, everything that we held dear, 240,000 miles away, it was clear that uh, that was the high point of the, of the entire mission for me. I would forget the technical end of it. At that point, the, uh, the aesthetics and the, the memories and the view of the Earth, it was the only the only place in the whole universe that had any color. Everything else was black and white. And that was great. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Several very, very prominent scientific people had postulated different, entirely different concepts of the lunar surface. One, uh, one said that, uh, the surface was 
was really a, a frothy type of fairy castles of rock and, and all that, of no structural substance. Uh, another said that much of the surface were great pools of dust and that if the landing happened to be in one of these pools, it would just sink down out of sight in all of this dust. Um, neither of those postulates were acceptable if we were going to land on the moon. And so we just thought about it and, and decided that neither one of those could be right, because how could great mountains exist on the moon if they have no structural substance? And how could there be great pools when clearly something, where would have all the dust come from? And that's when we decided that the surface, at least we sure got hope to, <laughs> the surface was not unlike the Sonora Desert or, or places like that on Earth. We created a special training vehicle uh, which would uh, simulate, from the standpoint of the way the vehicle flew, the one-sixth gravity of the moon. On one occasion, uh, when, when Armstrong was flying a lunar training vehicle, there, there was a problem. Somewhere in the control system, the thing started to dump. Parson, we had an ejection seat on that thing, and he ejected safely. And, and of course, we lost the lunar training vehicle. It crashed. NASA announced the uh, crew, who they would be. Buzz got in touch with me, telling me personally that he was accepted as a member of the crew, and he was totally elated over being one of the crew to land on the moon. My reaction was complete and absolute terror. I couldn't imagine his doing such a thing, even though I, I remembered that he had talked about it on our first date, but I never thought it would ever happen. Even, even when he got into the space program, I thought, well, they're never going to go to the moon. That's ridiculous. That's, you know, that's for comic books. Buzz and Joan came over to our house for dinner one evening, and after dinner, Buzz and I walked outside, and there was a full moon. And we stood there and looked at the moon, and then Buzz said, well, in just a few months, I'm gonna be right over there. observation that I made to myself before the mission was it would be much more comfortable to be on a later flight and enjoy things a lot more than being on the first flight. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, or I didn't have that option to, uh, to make that request. That's about the last request you'd probably make if, <laughs> if you said that. be alone and I would start to think about it. Think about Buzz going to the moon and that even though he said everything was going to be fine, how did he know that? And I, it, uh, I, I wrestled with a lot of, of um, demons during that period of time. Fear uh, comes in many different forms. Uh, um, it's horrible to be lonely, to fear loneliness. Now, is that more important than, than the fear of a locomotive running over you because your car is 
stuck on a crossing. They're, they're both petrifying, I'm sure. One is emotional and the other is uh, physical danger. I really don't think, and speaking for myself, that the physical fear was a part of Apollo at all. There was a good bit of emotional fear and psychological fear. Uh, but that's not what people, I think, are referring to. And that's certainly not the kind of thing that we're going to just volunteer our emotional fears. Neil Armstrong, Commander Apollo 11. Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. And the night before the launch, Buzz called me. It, it was, well, by the time we finished the conversation, I was crying. I think he was too. It was, um, it was a very, very touching, the things that he said. Buzz is not um, a person who expresses himself, his emotions well. But he, in effect, was, was telling me and the children that, you know, if by some chance something happened to him, you know, that, that, that we should know that, that he loved us and that we were important to him. In effect, that's pretty much what it was. But coming from Buzz, knowing him as I did at that time, I was truly, well, I was moved to tears. Getting ready for a, a mission, uh, to a great extent, was a, a ritual with me. Uh, I'm a Catholic, and I would uh, go to church uh, the morning of the mission, uh, the morning of a major event. Uh, then I would uh, come home, and I had uh, my wife, which is a tradition I established back in the Mercury program, would make me a brand new white vest for uh, each one of the missions uh, that I was to fly. Uh, she had a pattern, and I would wear this vest for the first time uh, for that particular mission. Uh, I'd go out to the uh, control room, control center, and I would walk through the back rooms, and I would try to get the, the, the sense of the feeling for the individuals. Uh, were they concerned? Were they confident? Uh, were they on top of the job? Were they tired? Uh, were they communicating well with each other? Was there any particular thing that was bothering them? And they knew that, uh, hey, uh, this was the team that was going to go do the job, and we were going to go to the moon that day. And uh, we didn't have to talk about it. We just uh, knew it. We had that, that sense, that, that bonding, that feeling, that communication. The people in our group had to be volunteers because when we went out to the spacecraft on Apollo, for instance, uh, the rocket was completely fueled, which had a uh, blast uh, potential of eight tenths of an atomic bomb. That's the reason you would find nobody else around for three and a half miles. The rocket being fully fueled, it sits there and kind of groans and moans. And every once in a while, it will scare the daylight out of you in a big sheet of ice slides down the side of a rocket and crashes down. So you have the feeling it's actually as a beast that's alive, uh, wanting to go. I 
was at a little reception with uh, Tom Paine, who was then the administrator of NASA. And we had word that uh, a, a wagon train uh, headed by the Reverend Jose Williams and others uh, had assembled on a, at a field near the main gate of Cape Canaveral. We needed to make a statement and bring the plight of the poor down to the space center. And my father was particularly saying to America that it's time that America pay attention to the poor people in this country. And that it was ironic that we could afford to spend billions of dollars on a space program to send a man to the moon but yet we could not feed poor people here on Earth. Our group would see to it that the crew at the last minute and on the last day, when they show up, we would put them in the spacecraft, uh, strap them down, apply all the uh, hoses and the electric connections, check it out once more, then go ahead, close the hatch, and uh, run a cabin leak check. So uh, somewhere along the line, at, uh, some of the astronauts had the impression I was very much like a dictator. It actually started out with John Glenn, who uh, just uh, named me the Pad Führer. And then uh, Pete Conrad, later on, when he talked to Armstrong one time, and Armstrong asked how to get along with me, uh, Pete said, oh, it's real simple. Just do whatever he tells you. And uh, Armstrong says, now, what can he do? if I just go ahead and throw a switch. Oh, Peter, oh, nothing so, is he just steps on your fingers. It was a hot, dusty day, and we went to the, to the gate and parked our car and took our jackets off and our ties and rolled our sleeves up. It was awfully hot, and we walked across this large field and it was like the two of us uh, facing uh, this army and Tom Paine said if uh, stopping the launch would do anything to solve your problems I would have the, the launch stopped and we said to Reverend Abernathy this is a moment of great pride for all Americans and will you join us I can remember um, my father being invited in to, to uh, view uh, the actual launching of this rocket and him requesting that I come along with him. And we went into a VIP section of the center. And it was an experience that I would never forget. We're on time at the present time for our planned liftoff of 32 minutes past the hour. Coming up shortly, that swing arm up at the spacecraft level will come back to its fully retracted position. This should occur at the five minute mark in the count. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. Skip Chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm now coming back. Senator Kennedy was invited to come to the launch. It had been his brother's commitment to land men on the moon and we thought it was very appropriate. Uh, he chose not to come. I believe at the time he seemed to feel that it was uh, Mr. Nixon and Mr. Agnew's party and uh, he should not sit in the stands and participate uh, at, at the Cape. We are still cold with Apollo 11. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. I personally uh, I'm sorry that he was not there because I always felt that his brother would have wanted him to, to be there. 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start.
dangerous portion of the mission is uh, the potential of running into the tower. In other words, the rocket doesn't go straight up, but it begins to go off to one side. Because if you collide with the tower, it's going to rip apart all the fuel and the oxidizer, and there's going to be a very big explosion right away. Uh, so that's the concern, uh, I think, that, uh, that everyone has, and they're anxious to hear the, the call out uh, tower clear. surprise us was that uh, we really couldn't uh, detect the moment of liftoff all that clearly. There was just the slightest hint of a swaying back and forth because of the guidance that would be steering the rockets. And of course, that would be all that uh, slight a movement that you wouldn't see it from the ground. You might feel it from the spacecraft, or you might imagine it. And I guess all three of us imagined the same thing. Are clear. 13 seconds. I can remember the rocket taking off, uh, a memory that I would never forget, the, the, the loud sound and the boom. Uh, it, was, it was an experience that uh, I have never experienced anything like it in my life since then. I had seen lots and lots of launches on television, but what got me was something that the Capcom said, that he said on every flight, always the last thing the Capcom would say is Godspeed. And that's, that still brings tears to my eyes because I don't know what it was about Godspeed that I just felt as though, you know, that that's, that's all that you could say. play at that time. There's no more politics, no more frustration. There's no, there's, that's it. You're going to commit. But you coolly know that one little thing, anywhere in a journey, can bring it to an end. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. About halfway through the mission, uh, there was a little bell on the AP wire in the office signifying an urgent story. And I remember going over and looked, and there was this chap, I couldn't even pronounce it. Chap of what? Chap of <laughs> I didn't know, I couldn't even pronounce it. It said something about a, a, a car driven by Senator Kennedy had driven off a bridge and a young lady had drowned. I regard as indefensible the fact that I did not report the accident to the police immediately.
What happened instead of uh, coming to the launch, he chose to, uh, to go home. Uh, Chappaquiddick occurred uh, that weekend, changed the course of, I think, the Kennedy family history, perhaps his own, his own history. As Apollo 11 was on its way to the moon, uh, the Russians announced that they were sending a probe, an unmanned probe, to the moon. And I was in Washington, and I got a call from Chris Kraft. He said, you know, uh, in a kind of a cynical way, I, well, your friends are, are uh, sending something to the moon. I hope it isn't going to follow us up. But can you find out what's going on? So uh, we sent a fax over to her, not a fax then, but I guess a telex then to, uh, to the Soviets. And uh, they responded with a complete trajectory and uh, an assurance that it would not be in any way uh, involved with the 11 trajectory. And I'm told it was the first time that they ever publicly announced any of the details of any of their, any of their trajectories. Looks like it's going to be impossible to get away from the fact that uh, you guys are dominating all the news back here in Earth. Even uh, Pravda in Russia is headlining the mission and calls Neil the czar of the ship. I uh, yeah, think maybe they got the wrong mission. We're 10 minutes away from ignition on translator injection. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for TLI. Or I felt awed by the responsibility of the mission, and that awe resulted in a uh, tunneling in of, of vision. You're not as exuberant as free wheeling with everything around you when you're very focused on what you're doing. more time to pick the daisies, so to speak. But I think uh, it's a tribute to the training that we have and to the discipline that I grew up with that said to me, hey, look, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you, but you better not be daydreaming and looking out the window when you're supposed to be doing something else. I tend to be an emotional guy. I tend to try to, to make my people see in technicolor what we're, what we're going to do. So as we uh, came up on the moon, in fact, it was we had been on shift. We had uh, uh, done all of the checks in the spacecraft. The command and service module had gone around the backside of the moon. And then I asked everybody to go over to what uh, the loop was called, AFD conference. And he said, all right, attention, everybody. And this is sort of strange. Uh, because this, we'd never done this in any symptom. I wonder what he's going to tell us. Maybe there's an announcement I didn't know about. Maybe I missed something while I was out. And he said, he said, made one of the most stirring speeches I've ever heard in my life. I mean, General Patton would have been proud of this speech. And I told them I was uh, very proud of them as individuals. Uh, I really enjoyed the times that we had worked together in getting ready for this mission. We had had some good times and some bad times. 
But we were the team that was going to go to the moon. There was no question about it. And that throughout this entire process, I wanted to let them know how valuable I felt was their contribution. And then he said something I'll remember all my life. He said, but no matter how it turns out, I'm behind you, and I'll be with you. And I'll tell you what, that for a young kid that's not too uh, sure anyway, because, you know, we're about to do the biggest thing we've ever done in our lives, all of us, and for a bunch of young flight controllers, that had to be the best thing he could have said at the time. Then I hung up the loop. We went to what we call battle short. Battle short is an interesting uh, condition that we set up for the control centers. We want no electrical power interruptions. So as we went to battle short, we actually put physical blocks over the circuit breakers in the building. We would prefer to, to burn up a circuit rather than have that circuit go out. And as soon as they identified they were in battle short, we locked the doors of the room. And we locked the doors so there is no disturbance. Nobody's going to walk in on us at a critical time. So we finished the talk in AFD conference. We went to battle short. We locked the doors, and we were ready. Position two, all flight controllers, 20 seconds to go, no go for landing. Things went wrong uh, right off the bat. We came around the side of the moon. As we came around, communications were terrible. Could hardly hear the crew. I could read half my computer parameters. Sometimes I'd get a few seconds of good data, then they'd go bad. I was wondering if we were going to have enough data to actually uh, let us start the landing. OK, all flight controllers, going to go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guys, go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Crew started the engine. Descent started. Comm started to get a little better. Things started to look up a little bit. And the minute we got good communications, I looked at one of my displays, and the first solid data I had, we had a navigation error of 20 foot per second in the computer. I remember hearing a little bit of discussion about uh, uh, that Neil was having with the ground. The, the landmarks that, that he expected at a certain time were not coming exactly when, when he thought they were. And um, I marvel that one is able to do that with eyeball. I, I thought, too, well, he's got to be joking. He didn't really mean that. <laughs> now, that didn't sound like much, but if that error would have grown to 35 foot per second, I would have had to stop this mission and abort it. Into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. How's our margin looking, Bob? It looks OK. We've okay. got four and a half. Roger. Eagle looking great. Here go. 30 seconds later, 30 seconds later, 1201, program alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Go. I was still so much thinking about the navigation error, I, I was thinking, what? What? 1201, what is that? What is that? The computer kept saying, hey, I cannot do all of the jobs you're asking me to do. Well, this put a real load upon the controllers because we had to figure out what the computer was not doing. We're okay, go, we're go. same time, we're go. So we uh, proceeded on that alarm, and it didn't come right back again, indicating that it wasn't all that serious. But the people on the ground, in rather quick order, were able to uh, give us a go on that alarm. How you doing? Pretty tall. We look good here, fine. All right, how about you, Tom? Go, go. guys, you happy? Go, go. Right go. And all of this occurred after uh, we reached the 500 feet above the ground. That was the point that uh, the commander was going to take over manual control for the landing. And then something really strange starts to happen. Instead of stopping and hovering and going down like the way they, I've seen them in simulation, they're doing a lot of search or forward motion. I don't think anything that he could have seen would have identified where we were or where we weren't, where we didn't know where we were, really. 540 feet down at 30, out of 15. 300 feet down, three and a half, 47 forward. There is no fuel gauge in the LEM spacecraft. And it'd say you got two minutes of fuel remaining. We would then uh, count down, and we had not, we would normally land at two minutes. So we got down to a minute, and we still hadn't landed. So we gave the crew the, the uh, 60 second call. Six forward. 60. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. We didn't know why he wasn't sitting down. We didn't know whether he couldn't see because of the dust, or he wasn't satisfied with something in the spacecraft. 
He didn't say much. Neil never said much. We were used to that, expecting that. At four forward, drift into the right a little. 30. 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Forward. I was totally focused upon the clock. And coming to this point in the mission where we were so close that we would have to give the crew the call at zero. When we hit zero, that was the crew lands now or aborts now. And we were, that was, we were watching that, that clock count down. If you ever have felt the time just stood still, each second seemed like an eternity then. Three and a half down, nine forward. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Be advised, there are lots of smiling faces in this room and all over the world, over. Well, there are two of them up here. I felt so focused in on doing exactly what was the most important for mission success, and somehow telling the Earth that we had landed was not that important. But there was a moment, I can't tell you exactly what second it was, that, uh, that I just reached over and patted him on the back but we didn't say anything. We had landed now, and in this control center, there's a viewing room that is, is behind my console. It's separated by uh, two panes of glass with airspace in between. Uh, the people in the viewing room started uh, cheering and applauding and clapping and stomping their feet. And this, this sound sort of seeped into the control room here. Our instructors were off in a room to their right. They were cheering there. And yet we couldn't relax at all because we had to take a look at the spacecraft systems. We had to get ready for what we call our time one stay no stay decision. Was it safe now to stay on the moon for for several minutes, or should we abort back off again? And I had to start a another gonna go, and I found I had grabbed onto the handles on the TV in my console in uh, almost a death grip. I mean, it, it was just holding on there, holding on to the console, and the other one I had a pencil. And I have a log book I was writing in, and I could not speak. As soon as that sound came in there for one or two seconds, I was paralyzed, and I finally was so frustrated because I had to get on with the T1 stay no stay decision. So I banged my hand in the console, and my pencil broke and flew up in the air. And uh, I just got over that personal climax in a couple seconds, and then we went back to business of uh, committing the crew to the extended stay on the surface of the moon. Back in 1969, I wrote a letter to the astronauts. And I thought maybe it might be better if I would remind them of how the moon is important to Hopi. And the main thing is the respect that they should have for the moon and not to dirty it in any manner. I never thought that Buzz was as deeply religious as I, I found out um, during that period of time. He had made these plans to um, take communion on the moon. At first I thought it was a little presumptuous, um, but I'm not Catholic, but I, I was raised as an Episcopalian. And you know, you, you, you don't give yourself communion. <laughs> I figured, you know, well, how else is he going to do it if he's going to do it? But it was a surprise to me. 
and, and I remember glancing at Neil when I, when I poured the, uh, the white wine out of the little piece of plastic container. The wafer was in, in a, a plastic uh, wrap seal, sealed up also. But I can, I can just remember looking at him and, and getting that unusual look at watching what I was doing. We had immediately said, well, let's get them some rest when we get to the moon, and we knew that damn well probably wouldn't work. How in the hell are you going to tell these guys that, hey, go to sleep, and we'll wake you up, and then you can go walk on the moon? We already knew that wasn't a good plan. in absolute awe of the fact that man was now about ready to walk in this moon and uh, it was a it was a sense of accomplishment it was a sense of exploration it was a sense of the united states of america it was a sense of pride perfection i mean as as uh, it's almost impossible to describe all of the feelings it was very emotional very intense time Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder. The surface appears to be very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass. Okay, I just checked. Uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's adequate to get back up. I'm going to step off the land now. that we all felt uh, was a culmination of uh, 10 years, and in some cases a lot, lot longer than that, of very, very difficult work. And it, it represented, at least in my opinion, it represented to the American society a kind of a, a culmination for several years of really rotten, rotten uh, internal domestic politics and uh, student uprisings, all precipitated by the Vietnamese War. I think it was almost a cleansing, or, or, or at least a reaffirmation that, uh, as a country, we, we weren't completely uh, in disarray. Yeah, I was extremely happy, and uh, I, happy just oh, sort of overfills, and it just comes pouring out, and uh, that's it. And I'm embarrassed, but I'm standing in front of this whole bunch of people, and everybody's wondering, why the heck's he crying? It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Neil, this is Houston. Uh, did you copy about the contingency sample? Over. All right, you're going to get to that just as soon as I finish uh, these picture series. Fair enough. Mike, it's a little difficult to dig through the... Uh, it's very interesting. It's a very soft surface, but uh, here and there where I plug with the, uh, with the contingency sample collector, I run into uh, a very hard uh, surface, but it appears to be uh, a very cohesive uh, uh, material of the, of the same sort. Okay, ready for me to come out? All set. Okay, I'm on the top step. It's a very simple matter to hop down from one... Buzz was another. affected by the fact of learning that he was not going to be the first one to step on the lunar surface. You've got three more steps and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave uh, I think all the attention focused in on that. Uh, 
regrettably uh, promoted a disharmony uh, among our crew. There was a bit more of a pressure uh, being the prime crew and that pressure was uh, irritated. It was uh, exasperated by the issue of who would be first and second. And we were the, we were the innocent pawns, I think, in that whole issue. That's a good step. When my foot hit the ground, dust went up and it all hit in, this, in a ring. And it doesn't do that on the earth. Uh, there's a sort of a billowing. Uh, and I can't really explain why it does that, but I did it a couple of times. And each time I did it, my foot went down and then out from it would the, the little clods in different sizes would, would all hit about the same, not too many short, not too many long, all about the same distance out. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Thank you again when you finish the panorama. Uh, you're going too fast on the panorama sweep. I haven't set it down yet. And the first thing that I thought when I saw the, um, the television was that it was a scene from a Walt Disney movie because it was grainy and um, you could tell that there were figures walking there, but they, they walked like um, marionettes. The, the movement was jumpy um, and um, it, it, it looked, they looked like cartoon characters in black and white. Isn't it fine? Hey, Neil, didn't I say we might see some purple rocks? Find the purple rocks? Yep. Very small, sparkly uh, fragments. We're very conscious of the fact that television was watching what we were doing, and if television wasn't watching it, people were listening very, very intently to the least little murmur that came from the moon. And you know what that does? I think that tunnels your vision in when you know that, that every little grunt that you make is going to be recorded, you parcel those observations out very carefully. And to two relatively reticent people, it ends up uh, kind of clamming them up. They don't say very much. And we didn't. Originally, the president had decided, of course, that this was going to be a mission from the planet Earth to the moon. And uh, the thought of, of uh, making it anything less than the whole Earth by planting the American flag there didn't seem to fit into that scenario. But people got to thinking more about uh, why shouldn't there be an American flag? After all, we had put an awful lot of money into this job. When we went to put the flag in, it, uh, it didn't want to stay because uh, we couldn't get the pole in very far. It wasn't sharpened enough to, to really penetrate. And, and there wasn't enough cohesiveness to the walls of the surface of the moon to, to hold it, unless you maybe kicked it with your foot. Then it, then it might uh, pat down and, and be compact enough. But we know there wasn't any wind up there that was going to blow it over. They've okay, got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the limit. Flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the limit. Beautiful. One of the, the, the things that we cranked into the plane was to place a, a phone call, which, uh, of course, the president did, in which he said this is the most historic phone call ever made. Go ahead, Mr. President. This is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. The crew was not really surprised. Uh, but they were pleased to have a call from the president. And I had uh, made sure, I thought, that there were a lot of questions that the president could ask so they would have a nice dialogue. I don't think that, uh, that I really counted on uh, the sort of Gary Cooper style of, uh, of uh, Neil Armstrong, who, while he didn't say yep uh, to every question, his, his answers were, were very short. United States, but and of peace of all nations, and with interest and a curiosity and with a vision for the future. It caught me totally by surprise. 
if it had been mentioned, it was in such a, an informal way that it might take place that it didn't sink in. Um, and, I, and I felt rather ill-prepared to uh, respond in front of millions of people to the president at that time. Uh, and I and I felt, see, I, I just wish I'd known about that a little bit ahead of time. Not that it made that much difference. All right, you do have to be uh, rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Sometimes it takes about two or three spaces to uh, make sure that uh, you've got your feet underneath you. And about two or three or maybe four easy paces can bring you to the fairly smooth uh, stop, like a football player, you just have to put out to the side and cut a little bit. So-called kangaroo hop does work, but it seems oh, your forward ability is not quite as good. Every moment that they were on the lunar surface was nerve-wracking for me. I, I, I just wanted uh, the mission to, to end. I wanted them to to join up with my college, the three of them to be together, to, to come back home, land safely, uh, and get it all over with. And, and, uh, and I, I kept saying to myself, you've done it. You've done it, you know. Don't, uh, don't, don't overplay your hand. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston, guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, right, understand, we're number one on the runway. My stomach was churning at the thought of that Lem having one engine and had to lift off and get those men back to the, to the mother craft. This, to me, was the most harrowing experience. After uh, we came in from our uh, EVA on the surface and were stowing everything away, I noticed on the floor of the cabin, on my side of the cabin, that there was a broken end of a circuit breaker. Clearly, it was the end of the plastic end of the circuit breaker, and uh, so I was wondering just which circuit breaker it was. So I looked along the rows, and <laughs> strangely enough, it was the engine arm circuit breaker. I felt that I could either push it in, and just like any other circuit breaker, it would stay in, but if I ever had to pull it out again, I would be uh, uh, in, in trouble, because I couldn't grab hold of anything. Gene Krantz and others on the ground told us afterward that, that in those hours they learned more about alternate ways to get that engine started if that circuit breaker uh, didn't stay in when we pushed it in. But fortunately it did. Adam, stage, When the ascent stage of the limb blasted off, that was quite a shock because when all the pieces of insulation just went it, it, you know, it looked like an explosion, and for a split second, I thought, my God, it's blown up. There was a, a hell of a wind <laughs> of rocket exhaust that went in all directions, and uh, Neil wanted to sort of keep that quiet, the fact that he had seen the flag blow over when we lifted off. Uh, he, he thought that would kind of ruin the moment for, for uh, somebody when they leave to knock over the flag. It, it is. Seems a little clumsy, perhaps, but... <laughs> it's, it's hard to really keep your perspective in this, in this room because you're surrounded by absolutely incredible individuals accomplishing great events against extremely large odds. I mean, it's just, just, it finally comes together here, and when you see something like the moonwalk, you say, God, this is what living's all about. There was a lot of dust all over our suits, and even though we'd brushed each other off, a lot of that dust came in on our boots and was on the floor. And once we uh, took the helmets off, uh, I think we both noticed a distinct pungent odor in the cabin, a good bit like uh, wet charcoal or wet ashes from a fire. And uh, I guess we'd have to attribute it to the presence of uh, the lunar material. 
Alan Bean did say one thing that I thought was interesting, and I laughed about it later. He said to me, you know, once Buzz comes back from the moon, your lives will never be the same. And as far as Buzz is concerned, he'll have the whole world at his feet. At the time, it sounded pretty good. A year later, I wasn't so sure that I wanted that kind of a life, and I know that Buzz didn't at first. I know he didn't. Once the parachutes are open, the, uh, the the next maybe sensation that you have is that you start breathing in uh, salt air. <laughs> when when the pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside, the, the outside air begins to vent on in, and you get that uh, that odor of uh, salt air, and and that's a noticeable thing. You know you're home <laughs> when you smell that salt water. The, the next thing that happened after we hit the water was that we hit pretty hard because uh, it was a little bit rougher seas than maybe we had expected. And the way that we hit uh, made it difficult for us to jettison the parachutes. They had pulled us over and we were upside down. We came within that close of getting seasick. That's not the way to come back from the moon to, uh, to barf in the spacecraft before you get picked up. feeling of absolute total exhaustion. Uh, when we get the crew on the carrier, that is when uh, you really realize how tired you are. It's sort of like somebody had, had taken a great big bottle filled with all of the emotions, the challenges, the risks, and all of those things, and then immediately pulled the plug and everything drains out of it. That's exactly how you feel when, this, uh, uh, when the mission's over. Uh, you really feel like uh, you heard the term drain. That's what it's all about. But, it's a good feeling. It's a, it's a feeling that now, yeah, uh, we did what we said we were going to do. We were truly professionals. We executed our plans perfectly. Uh, this is what the business is all about. 
I really was so confident this time as opposed to the way I felt yesterday, and I guess it really showed. I think I'm going to have to have about three or four days to really let it sink in. Of course I'm, in quotes, thrilled, proud, and happy. But it's so much more than that that I just can't find the words. One of the remarkable things that uh, I remember happening in the trailer, the flight surgeon who was in there with the three of us, he said that he had some uh, tapes of the television programs that covered uh, the broadcast during, during our landing and our flight. He said, would you like to see some of these? So in a small little television set, he started playing the uh, commentators that were talking about our flight, whether it was the landing or whatever. And just so, spontaneously this thought crossed my mind and I reached over to Neil and I said hey Neil look we missed the whole thing and what I meant by that was far more than po what popped into my mind was that we were so interested in what was happening in the mission see? but that what was happening was not up there it was happening back here we were out of town for the most important parts of that mission to me, the most important part of the mission was what happened in the minds of the people who witnessed that event. They will never forget that. We won't either. But something very important happened, and it wasn't up on the moon. It was a realization that humanity can do those kind of things. They were all in the quarantine trailer together. They got into Houston quite late, and uh, we were naturally all there to welcome them. And I had my turn at the microphone to talk to Buzz, because that was the only way we could communicate. And the first words he said to me was, I need some clean jockey shorts. And that just really broke me up. But that I, I'm sure he planned to say that, but it was the, absolutely the perfect thing to say at that time. My life changed not because of what I saw or did or experienced on the moon. My life changed because in the minds of other people around me, I went to the moon. And, and somehow I uh, have to live up to that in some fashion, or I have to acknowledge that. I can't run away from that. That is a part of my life, uh, and it started 25 years ago.
God, we were there. Why the heck did we surrender? Why did we not go back? Why have, why have we become so complacent about exploration? Uh, why do we not continue to pursue every opportunity to delve into the unknown, to, to unlock the mysteries? Why are we not sending our explorers not only to the moon, but uh, on to Mars? It's really frustrating to see us there. And then all of a sudden, just sit back and say, okay, it's all over. That's, that's unacceptable to me. I think that we were probably the luckiest people on the face of the earth in the last 500 years to be involved. And I'm, I feel trem a tremendous sense of accomplishment that we were able to do it and wonder if we can do it again. It was worth it. It was worth the, unfortunately, the lives that we lost. It was worth the dollars that we spent. And uh, America was, I don't think it's been the same since then. Uh, we may not have it in, in the forefront of our minds, but this was uh, the great American accomplishment. I haven't heard too much about uh, what they thought of the moon. About the only thing that uh, I, I hear is that what the man can do a lot of things and make it real. And that's probably what they did with the moon. Now that's just one planet, but they're certainly thinking about other planets like the Mars, for instance. They'll probably get there eventually. At least 170 German citizens were brought to trial and convicted in 1944 as participants in the last plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. It was not an isolated act, but only the last of over 20 attempts and plots to overthrow the Nazi leadership. Acts of individual conscience at war with an overpowering national consensus. Hat für mich mancherlei Schwierigkeiten in der Folge gehabt, weil ich ja sehr lange für das...